Welcome back friends. It's another exciting cheese episode. Today we are going to make the Spanish cheese manchego. I have made this twice before. The first time last year, about a year ago, and then I opened it when I had some friends and family over and it was the hit of the party. And so I absolutely had to make it again. Um, it's still in the cheese cave and I rubbed it with smoked paprika. So I did a smoked paprika manchego. I'm sure it's delicious, but I'm aging it a little bit longer. Today, we're gonna make a manchego. I'm gonna show you how to do a plain manchego. And then once it's out of our brine and it's got a good rind on it and it's dried, we're gonna soak it in red wine. How can that not be good? <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna do like a red wine soaked cheese. And so it, the wine doesn't go all the way through. It just kind of permeates the skin, the rind a little bit and gives it that beautiful color on the edge, especially when you cut into it. So that's what we're making today from our home cheese making book. This is on page 188. Very easy to do. Now, if you've been following along on any of the hard cheese recipes and videos, you'll start to see a really good pattern here, right? The more you do it, the more you get into it, the more you realize this isn't that hard. This is not that difficult and you totally can do it. So we're starting with two gallons of milk. You'll see over there on the counter, two gallons of raw milk. You can use store-bought milk. I'd recommend whole milk, not skim milk, uh, when you're making cheeses. Um, and I would recommend, I mean, if you can get raw, I would do raw. If you can get low pasteurization or what's called vat pasteurization, I would recommend that. Um, but really just any whole store-bought milk would work. Preference would be organic if you're going to the store. All right, so two gallons of milk, we're gonna do a half teaspoon calcium chloride diluted in a quarter cup of non-chlorinated water, right? This step, as well as what we do with the rennet, half a teaspoon of rennet, diluted in a quarter cup of non-chlorinated water. Those two things are pretty ubiquitous across all hard cheese recipes in this book. So you're not gonna see me add that. I've already got my measuring cup over there with it measured out, but Again, if you've been following along, it's really simple and this is something we're doing from recipe to recipe. We're gonna do a half a packet of thermophilic culture and half a packet of mesophilic culture. So again, thermophilic and mesophilic are the two cultures we're using today, half each. Again, pretty ubiquitous across the recipes. Not all recipes use both, but recipes usually use one or the other along with possibly other cultures too. Um, the new thing today is lipase. Uh, this is the lipase. It is a powder um, and it's basically for flavoring. It's a mild, it's an enzyme. So it's for mild flavoring and they use it for feta, mozzarella, Parmesan, and we're using it for our manchego. So it's optional. You don't need it, but it does add a little bit more depth of flavor. All right, first and foremost, again, just like the other recipes, we're gonna get our milk into the pot and we're gonna heat it up to, for this recipe, 72 degrees. Okay, we are at 72. I'm gonna turn the burner off, pour in my calcium chloride solution stir really well. Sprinkle in my half a packet of thermophilic and my half a packet of mesophilic, right? And we're gonna just sprinkle that on the surface of the milk and let it rehydrate. So it's been two minutes since I sprinkled the culture on top. You always want to let it sit on top of the surface for approximately two minutes. It just helps rehydrate the cultures before you stir them in because they are freeze dried. So it's been a couple minutes. We're gonna stir them in. Remember top to bottom as well as back and forth. And we should still be around 72 degrees. 
We're gonna leave that at 72 degrees for 15 minutes. While the culture is sitting for 15 minutes, we're gonna go ahead and get our rennet ready. So starting here, a quarter cup of non-chlorinated water. We're going to add a half teaspoon rennet. And we're gonna get our lye paste ready. And I am doing lye paste in my manchego. So again, I have a quarter cup of non-chlorinated water and I'm adding a quarter teaspoon of the lye paste powder. And you wanna do this about 15 to 20 minutes prior to using it so that it has time to truly dissolve because if you can kind of see, it's just powder sitting on top. So I'm gonna stir that in and give that time to truly dissolve. I wanted to say one thing because it's hard when you're just watching this on YouTube, right? You have no idea the time it takes or how long does it take to get up to temperature. So I really wanna specify that because this is one of the things I um, definitely misunderstood or um, oversimplified when I first began cheese making. And that was when I'm reading a recipe and I think, okay, I've gotta bring it up to 88 degrees or 72 degrees or 102 degrees. I think that is gonna take so long. And so then I just put my burner on high and I'll occasionally stir it and I'll go do other things, right? That's not really the case. And so if you think about it, right, think about the temperature your refrigerator's at, when you take your milk out, you're already probably around 45 degrees, maybe a little bit higher if you had it sit on the counter for a few minutes. So you're not bringing it up like hundreds of degrees like you think of with an oven. Again, it's just a totally different mindset with cheese making and I had to reframe my thinking when I started. And so I'm saying this in hopes that it helps you. The time it took me to get to 72 degrees was probably 10 minutes. I mean, I did go start a load of laundry and you know, stir and whatnot, but you just wanna be mindful that you are not walking away for extended periods of time and forgetting it. Cheese making really is simple. It is not labor intensive, it is time intensive, but if you're already home, if it's a day that you're already being home, like this really rainy day today, then it's a perfect opportunity to just take advantage of that time and you still get to do other things in your day. But don't walk away and forget your cheese for an extended period of time. Okay, 15 minutes is up. I'm going to turn the burner on low because I'm already at around 75 degrees. It increased a little bit just from the thermal mass of the milk from 72. So we're gonna go to 86 degrees now. Now again, this recipe is a little bit different because normally after you add the calcium chloride, you let it sit, then you do the rennet. We are actually gonna heat it to 86, leave it at 30 minutes at 86 degrees, and then we will add our rennet and our lye paste. So I'm gonna turn my burner on low because like I said, I'm already at 75. It's not gonna take long. Once I get to 86, I'll set the timer for 30 minutes and then we'll come back. Our 30 minutes is up at 86 degrees. So now we are going to add our lye paste and rennet. Here's the rennet. We really wanna keep the 86 degrees as much as possible. So I'm just gonna stir all of that in really well, again, back and forth and top and bottom. Hopefully we are close to 86. Yep, perfect. Once that is wonderfully stirred in, I'm gonna put the lid back on and go for 30 more minutes. 30 minutes are up from after adding our lye paste and our rennet, and we are now gonna cut into vertical three quarter inch columns and then let it sit for five minutes to help some of that whey release.
five minutes is up and we are going to use a stainless steel whisk here to really cut the curds up into smaller bite-sized pieces. It's just as simple as this. But make sure you go all the way to the bottom. And then over the next 45 minutes, we are going to slowly increase the temperature to 102 degrees. We are currently at just under 85, 84.9. So I'm gonna put it on a level two on my stove top, because again, we wanna do this over a 45 minute period. You don't wanna heat it up too fast, but you wanna get the curds heated up so we can get more whey released. And I think we've got all the curds properly cut. So over the next 45 minutes, just gently stir, right? And keep checking the temperature um, but we really want to make this a slow process and you're stirring every few minutes so that the curds don't become matted into a complete mass. So I'm going to do this for the next 45 minutes and bring it to 102 and we'll come back. 45 minutes is up approximately and I'm at 102 degrees. I took my pot over here off the stove and I've let it sit for about five to seven minutes just to have that whey come to the top and let the curd mass go to the bottom. It's a lot easier then to pour off some of the whey and get all of those curds into our cheese mold. So I've got my Manchego two pound mold lined with cheesecloth and I'm going to pour off some of the whey up top and then spoon in the curds. All right, cheese is in the cheese mold. Um, it's gonna go at 15 pounds pressure for 15 minutes. We're gonna take it out, flip it, rewrap it, and again, 15 pounds for 15 minutes. Uh, and then we're gonna go 30 pounds for six hours. So on, you know, undo, rewrap 30 pounds for six hours, and then it will go in a saturated brine. So I will come back and flip this in 15 minutes. All right, now we are going to rewrap and go at 30 pounds pressure for six hours. Looks great. It has been six hours and it is time to pull our manchego out of the press and it is going to go into our saturated brine for six hours. Now, if you remember when we made our Montasio cheese, we did the same thing, right? We put it in our saturated brine, which is basically really salted water, and there is a specific ratio, so don't just think you can salt some water. It's in the book. You can look it up and then get that specific ratio for salt to water. It's gonna go in here for six hours. It's going to actually go in the refrigerator. Now the recipe says 55 degrees. My fridge is a little bit colder than 55, but room temp is absolutely warmer than 55. So in the fridge, it's going to go six hours. Halfway through, I will flip it. Considering it's seven o'clock at night, I will get up in the middle of the night 
and uh, take it out at the six hour mark. I just won't film that. And then it will dry and I'll show it to you in the morning. In the meantime, now let's get it out. how beautiful that is that is one of the things i love about the manchego mold is that it creates this gorgeous design this imprint on the cheese so looks perfect smells perfect we're just gonna throw this in the brine well maybe not throw it Okay, so my vessel is not deep enough, so I'm going to pour some more of the saturated brine in. We're going to salt the top. and put this in the refrigerator carefully. It's in the fridge. So in three hours at 10 o'clock tonight, I will flip it, resalt the top, put it back in the fridge. And then at 1 a.m. this morning, can't wait for that, I'm going to take it out of the brine and set it on a very clean drying rack over a plate. Uh, and then with one of my tents and just let it sit. And then in the morning we'll sink back up, but really it's gonna dry out for maybe a day before we put it in our red wine soak. So I'll see you tomorrow. So I'd love to say good morning, but it's 1.30 in the afternoon, so good afternoon. <laughs> so I did take the Manchego out of the brine. I flipped it at 10 o'clock last night and I have to tell you the truth. So at 11.30 p.m. I was like, oh my gosh, I have an hour and a half left to go of this and then I take it out of the brine. Do I do that? Do I set my alarm for 1 a.m. and take it out and do everything I need to do then or do I just do it now? I did it then. <laughs> so at 11.30 last night I was like, screw it, I'm taking it out of the brine and I'm going to bed and that's what I did. So here's our Manchego. It is beautiful. What we're going to do is soak this in red wine. Now you could skip this step if you preferred to. And really what I would do if I was not going to do this red wine step is I would take a little bit of a really good quality olive oil and I would rub the surface of my manchego with the olive oil. And that is because you don't want it to dry out too much. So I would rub the surface and then I would leave it to air out on the drying rack with the cover for maybe another day or two, just to kind of help that olive oil create this beautiful rind to seal the moisture in. And then I would vacuum seal it and put it in the cheese cave. But today we're soaking in red wine. So I have a beautiful red wine here, courtesy of Dry Farm Wines. You may have heard me talk about Dry Farm, uh, I have become an affiliate with them and I am so excited about this because I have been partaking in dry farm wines now for over a year and it is the only wine that I prefer to drink. Um, a little bit about them really quick. So dry farm wines is not a winery. They literally are a distributor, but they're just not any distributor. They are a distributor of finely, cu they curate the most amazing wines from all over the globe and it's the cleanest and purest wines they find a lot of the wineries that they're curating from are family owned generationally owned where they're doing regenerative agriculture and they're doing organic practices and biodiversity with the soil and it's just all the right things and it creates the most pure and clean wine sometimes even with lower alcohol content but the best part is that you can have a glass or two or maybe more and not feel like junk 
the next day. That's my favorite part, literally my favorite part. You can just enjoy the wine without the repercussions. And so down below in the show notes, there is a link if you would like to try Dry Farm Wines out, click below and on your very first order using that link, you will get an extra bottle for one penny and it's totally worth it. So I am going to be soaking my Manchego in a dry farm red. This is actually a Saint Laurent from the Austria, the country of Austria. Um, I have had this wine before. I actually got a couple of bottles of this and it's so good. So this is what we're using today. And I am going to soak my red wine or my Manchego in the red wine for probably two to three hours, flip it to the other side, and then we'll take it out. It's now time to vacuum seal our wine soaked manchego. So I left it in the wine for about five to six hours, periodically flipped it, rolled it around, right? I didn't have an entire bowl of wine like I would the brine, the saturated brine to soak it. And plus it didn't float in the wine. So I really did kind of move it and flip it a decent amount over that five to six hour period. Here it is. You can see that some of the wine has certainly adhered better in some spots than others. But I smell the cheese with a hint of the wine. It smells really good. So we're gonna vacuum seal this. I took it out of the wine last night around 6 p.m. So it's been aging um, for 14 to 16 hours, not aging, but sitting out for 14 to 16 hours just to dry off. You don't want to ever vacuum seal your cheeses if there's a lot of moisture on them. While it creates a wonderfully humid environment for aging, you don't want it too humid for mold growth. So let's get this vacuum sealed. So this is now ready for the cave. This cheese can age anywhere from three to 12 months. I am probably gonna go closer to the nine to 12 month time period. So I'll mark this down in my cheese journal so I'll know when to open it. I also wanted to show you the smoked rubbed, smoked paprika rubbed manchego that I made. Um, this one has been aging now for three months um, and you can kind of see the, the difference here in size. It's even just a little bit smaller in height um, but the smoked paprika you can kind of see the hint of the color on the outside of this one so this will go a little bit longer um, and this is going to go anywhere from like I said 9 to 12 months so thanks for joining me on the wine soaked manchego journey today I will see you next time stay healthy stay well bye bye